Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second day of Bugfest Plan B. We are so excited that you are joining us today. And we are very excited about our next program. And if you've joined us for any of our virtual programs, you will know we always start our programs with an icebreaker question. And so the question I have for you today is, what is your favorite plant to plant in your garden to attract native pollinators? So just put that in the chat. And while you are answering that question, I'm gonna go through a quick Zoom tutorial just in case you are not quite familiar with Zoom yet. So the first thing I wanna say is that um, all of our participants will have microphones off and videos off because we are recording this program. Um, and um, so if Nancy could please hit record, that would be awesome. And uh, then we see down here where it says captions. We have live captions provided for you. If you need those captions, you wanna click on that button and click show subtitle. And then subtitles will look like that. And then next, we want you to have the best possible um, experience here in Zoom. So you wanna click up at the top, um, you has view options, choose speaker view. Then you will just see our speaker. And then next, if you see it on the Zoom slide, that B is kind of on the flower. We want to see both the flower and the B. So click side by side mode. And then you can adjust how big the slide is versus um, the, the person's view um, just by sliding that bar there. Okay, lastly, please talk to us in the chat. We love hearing from you. Ask questions, make comments, but Keep it, don't spam the chat and, um, and be a good digital citizen and be kind and respectful to everyone. And if you have any um, issues during the presentation, Nancy is our moderator. You can um, connect with her either private chat um, or in the main chat, just if you're having any problems and she'll help you sort those out. Okay, with that, let's see what we what folks favorite plants are um butterfly bush that is a really good one i'm gonna tell you mine and and um mine's not a native plant unfortunately but i have a rose of sharon and boy do those bees love that plant so uh john what's oh cardinal flower Ooh, that's a good one milkweed of course milkweed's fantastic um uh, and then we have uh, over on YouTube, we have zinnia in passion flower. I just planted a passion flower and it did not make it. So <laughs> I need some more of that. <laughs> I went on vacation right after I planted it and it did not get the water that it required to survive. So with that, I'm going to introduce our speaker. So John Gerwin is the research curator of ornithology at the museum, but he is also just an absolutely incredible naturalist. Um, and he has a fabulous yard and does all kinds of documentation of the visitors um, to his yard. So today he's going to talk to us a little bit about some of the hymenopterans that have come to visit his beautiful garden. So John, it, take it away. All right. Thanks, Carrie and everybody for coming out. I might as well just go ahead and start the old screen sharing. It usually takes a minute. Oh, and John, so Marcel in the chat put mint. So mint. were so you going to tell us your favorite? You know, I like a mint and I've got two kinds of mint in my yard. One is mountain mint and the other, I can't remember the common name uh, to relate. I think it's a pycnanthemum, but the bees just go, actually bees and wasps just go crazy for that mint. Even some wild looking beetles come to it. So that has turned out to be my favorite. I am loading up the uh, presentation here. Yeah, we can see it. it looks All good. All right, we're good to go here. Move oh, and, and Jennifer to... put lavender. I missed that That's one. That's a nice plant. <laughs> That's a really pretty one. <laughs> I use that in my kitchen <laughs> just, the, just for the aroma. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to see if we can move on. So, yeah, I'm going to be talking about bees, wasps, and and some things that look like them, what we call bee mimics. Um, 
a little collage of things from my yard and a little quote, something to think about. <clears throat> and if you were not sh for sure what diaphanous was, one of my favorite words, I'm always looking for excuses to use some of these cool words. So of course it's the, it's the idea of somewhat a transparent or translucent surface like these bees show here. I'd like to point out at the beginning that um, most of these images are mine and they are with a like a simple point and shoot camera. I don't try to be a nat National Geographic photographer because that uh, most of us see things a little imperfectly. My my 60 year old eyes certainly are not what they were, but I, I just think that's a better way to, to show things. And I encourage people to go out with even the simplest technology, go out with your smartphone or just a simple, <clears throat> again, point and shoot camera and document things. And I'll, uh, at the end, go over some resources I use uh, for ways that I like to identify things. Because again, I, as Carrie said, I'm a ornithologist, but a, a naturalist at heart. I don't know all the bees and wasps, but I like to use a site, for example, iNaturalist, and there's an associated app called Seek that I like to use, and that's on, on your smartphone and, or on your laptop. So I'll talk about some of this at the very end, some resources. One thing I won't talk about are honeybees because that's, that's all, the honeybees are always in the news and there's plenty of information out there for folks to gather up on these. And I'm gonna be talking about the things that you might not have realized are right outside your front or back door. And so I've spent a lot of time in the last couple of years, especially thanks to our uh, pandemic experience. I, I take a break from work and go, go outside for 10 minutes and look at all these things in my garden. And that's, that's where I became aware of a lot of different species of bees and wasps that were coming to my flowers. I knew some things were out there. I didn't know to what extent. And so, so what does it look like out there? Well, this is the, this is my front yard. This is just, you can see my car is parked behind here. And it's um, the dog, you know, is about three feet long. So this is about a 12 by eight foot section in the front yard. Uh, a lot of native flowering plants, <clears throat> but it's not very big. And then in the backyard here on the left is um, there's a small, there's a little small patch right here. That's only about six by three feet. And then over, over behind it here, this patch, it's, it's about 20 by 10. But again, these are not very big patches. Uh, I worked on them for the first few years, got things established. You can plant some things like these sunflowers. These are native sunflowers. You can put them in the ground in April and by July they're flowering, but it take, give them a couple of years and their roots are really well set and I hardly have to water them. So this is where I uh, have enjoyed a lot of the last 19 months. My neighbor up the street, you know, it doesn't have to be all native. I, I promote native, but not exclusively. There's some really good plants like this lantana in the middle. It's a, it's a really interesting magnet for a lot of pollinators. And then my neighbor had a little dirt patch that complements the city. When they put in the sidewalk, they left this little strip of dirt by his front yard and he just got him a seed mix, threw it in the ground and just to see what would happen, he got all these cosmos and four o'clocks and other things that came up and there's a bunch of pollinators on there. So when we walk the dog up there, it's a couple blocks away, I get a few photos from there. So you can you can use a mix of things and uh, get a lot of things to come to your yard. And, it's, and it was pretty easy for him. He just threw the seeds on the ground and they grew. <laughs> So let's look at the, <clears throat> a quick look at the, the, the big picture here, the hymenoptera, the bees, wasps, ants, and sawflies. I'm, I'm just focusing on bees and wasps. And if you look at the line here, this is a, a tree of life, evolutionary tree. So you can see that this group has been around for, for a long time. So between the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, they first show up, they branch off. And then another, another thing to look at is here, the next group, which is what we call their sister relatives or it would be like their first cousin. These are the flies, the dipter, and these are butterflies and moths. So this, this trio are the most closely related to each other. That's the best evidence we have. And that's interesting to me because there are some of the lookalikes that I'll talk about or just show you pictures of about halfway through. And they are, they are from this, these two groups. They look like bees and wasps, but they're flies and, and moths. So over 150,000 species of Hymenoptera I'm sure most of you know the females are fertile and do the stinging, not the males. Uh, many of them predators, the wasps especially, are carnivorous. And then many of the others are consuming pollen and nectar. Many parasitize. 
another arthropod like beetles, and then some parasitize other bees and wasps. So it's a, it's a real uh, zombie world out there. And then of course, there's a whole big circle. So when I'm attracting things to my yard, but you know, somewhere along the line, we're just food for somebody else. So here's a, one of those flies, it kind of looks like a bee, but it's a robber fly. And it is in fact, slurping away on my, one of my bumblebees here. Um, here is a lynx spider and it's uh, found its lunch with one of these bee lookalikes. It looks like a fly. Um, I like to plant for butterflies and moths and, and I provide larval food hosts, but those caterpillars become food for some of these other things like the paper wasp there around. And then as I said, some of them sort of feed on each other. They, uh, they lay eggs on the other's larvae. And, and that's something I'll mention several times throughout just to highlight who's doing what out there. So I have more to say about wasps and bees in general, uh, just because there have been more wasps in my yard. And you'll be able to hear a little bit more about backyard bees in uh, the next talk, as I understand it. Um, but that said, we'll start with a few bees. So the bees, uh, our data indicate that they evolved from predatory wasps. So here's a, another little tree of life. And these are wasps down here that <clears throat> evolved first. And so you can see the names of these from genetic and morphology data. Other scientists that have studied this have put together this tree. And then all the data show that the bees came out of this group. In other words, uh, and bees are, are, are vegetarian. So they evolved from a, a carnivorous group of relatives. One of the ones that comes out in, in the spring in my yard is the brown belted bumblebee. In general, bumblebees nest underground. It's not always, quote, fully underground. They might be in a burrow of rodent burrows, which are where the grass has been matted down and, and the bees go into that. But they can, they can be more underground or they can be in other situations that are like rotted wood. It's sort of half underground. And the bees, again, are vegetarian. They're after nectar and pollen. There are over 20,000 species around the world. And of that, there's uh, around 500 in North Carolina. So I'm just gonna show a few that, that come out to my yard. And many of them are ground nesting and many are solitary. Uh, we, we often see the bees out there together, but it turns out of all the, you know, these 500 species, most of them are in fact live a solitary existence. So I hear a couple, a couple of close-ups of the brown belted bumblebee. <clears throat> looks like looks like a June photo from this flower. Um, you you know here it's not very brown, but you, if you look close, you'll see a little bit of tan coloration here, a little tan here. Um, and then that just points out there's there's, there's variation. I'm going to show you one next. It's more brown, and also sometimes it just can be hard to know what's what. Sometimes I just have to accept that it's a bumblebee and species, and and maybe it's different, but I'm not sure which one it is. Even the experts sometimes have, have a hard time telling a given individual bee, uh, and that's okay. I'm just happy to have them around. Um, but here's a better example of brown belted bumblebees. So if you look here, you'll see it's kind of a rusty patch on here. And I shouldn't use that phrase because there's the rusty patch bumblebee, which is actually now an endangered species. So um, it's the rusty patch on a rusty patch bumblebee is in a slightly different spot. But anyway, this is a, a nice uh, reddish, orangey brown coloration on these guys and here's another one up close <clears throat> and this species is more likely to nest in a bird box than any of the other ones uh i think there's one other that will sometimes use a bird box but the the half dozen times that i've had a bee in a box it's been the brown belted and around where i live in west raleigh a neighbor of mine and i we put up boxes in some local city parks and a local elementary school it's near our, near where we live and uh, she goes out and checks and she texted me one day and said, look at this. I just got stung by a bee checking the bird box. I said, well, take a picture. So she did. And it turned out, I said, I wanted to see what it looked inside. Uh, here's what a brown belted bumblebee's nest looks like on the inside. The moss here is a chickadee. So these bees had moved in after the chickadees had nested. But here's one doing its thing. And here they are hanging out. So then I went home and I knew I had them in my box. I hadn't been quite brave enough to open them up, but I did this time and I took the little cup out and you can see the little bee hiding here and one down here. So they, they get the vegetation and they chew it up and they make this really fine filamentous material for their nest. 
And it looks pretty cozy, actually. Uh, and then they lay their eggs razor young in here. So another one that's in, in my yard, all over the neighborhood, really all over the area, is the common eastern bumblebee. Um, in general, I see a lot of smaller individuals, smaller than the brown belted, uh, smaller than the next one I'll show, which is an American bumblebee. These guys are, um, you can see here's the top of a uh, smooth oxide. It's a native sunflower, and you can see it's a pretty, there's a pretty small bee. And New York ironweed is another plant that I really like in the yard. So here's another one. These guys have more yellow up here on the thorax. They have usually this first section of their abdomen is yellow. Sometimes it'd be a little bit more. Uh, again, there can be a little variation. Sometimes there's less yellow here, but that's a general pattern. Now here's a couple more. So looking down on one, you can see what it's like. They often show a little bit of this gray and black on their abdomen. And this guy, you can see doing what he do, not only is he getting nectar here, but also picking up all sorts of pollen. Um, <clears throat> So another species is, that's the larger one that I see in the yard is this American bumblebee. And here, the top part is sort of half yellow and black, and that's pretty typical. And then the abdomen has more yellow. And in this case, the one on the right, all yellow. So that's what I mean about some of the variation. Uh, you think of the different species, but that the, what the experts say is that there's just, there's just variation in the amount of yellow. Or in this case, it's yellow all the way up here too. So there's a very yellow individual. And here's a few more examples. Again, New York ironweed, it's really uh, attractive to a lot of pollinators. And here's a mountain mint. And you'll see, you'll see a lot of these photos. You'll see the mountain mint in the background of a lot of the photos I have. It is a real, uh, it's a real magnet. There are minor or what we call minor or digger bees around. And I have not seen one yet in the yard. They nest in loose soil. So they build these little chimneys and get in the soil. But for me, one of the challenges is that they look like a bumblebee. So they can be hard to tell apart. And uh, they're, they're more, the easiest way to tell them apart is probably if you find a nest. I've seen photos. People have sent me photos nearby where they have something in their yard and it, and it has this structure. And I can tell it's a, a digger bee. But I haven't been able to, I haven't found one yet. But they're around. I've had mason bees only a couple times. So this is one of them. And this is a small bee. It's maybe this one and a half uh, times the size of my thumbnail. So it's not a very large bee, but it's a very hairy bee. And they're cavity nesters. Some of you may have put out little uh, little blocks of wood where you can drill into them. It's like a birdhouse for bees. Uh, you can put like 25 holes in a block of wood and put it out and it will attract these bees because they it's it's one female per per little cavity. She'll lay one egg in this and, and put something inside for the larvae to eat. Uh, the, the genus is Osmia and there are there's one called orchard bee. People will specifically raise them and put them out for helping to pollinate fruit tree plants, crops. Um, there's a, a sort of a, it's a little industry of, of raising mason bees for people to use in their in their orchard. I'll come back. I'll come back to this guy in, in just a second for uh, for uh, an organism that that feeds on them. Um, but first, there's a little tiny one that that hangs out in the yard. Uh, you're probably familiar with sweat bees. This is one called the pure green, or some people call it metallic green sweat bee. It is metallic green. It's like a hummingbird. Really, it's like a iridescent green hummingbird. Is one with the sunlight hitting it. it's a little closer. You can see how small it is. I mean, it's a little thumbnail sized bee. There may be other species around. This is the only one I have found so far. Just a little bit bigger than a sweat bee are a group of bees called furrow bees, lots of different species. There are two in our area <clears throat> that are so similar that you really can't tell them apart uh, without a dissection. That, that's what I've read and I've been told. So one is called poe, one ligated, but they nest in the ground. You'll, you may have a little clump of these tiny bees flying around by your front steps or porch or the side of the house where there's a patch of dirt. They'll build these little ca uh, cavities in the little burrows in the ground. Um, they have a little striped abdomen and you can see pretty hairy back legs. And then this one's picking up a lot of pollen on the back leg. But in, in June and July, I, I will, there'll be dozens of these out back along with the bumblebees. And then 
a similar looking one is a longhorn bee. I mean, it's it, you can see it's not that different from from a, <clears throat> a furrow bee, but its antenna are longer. So one of my friends and colleagues with the Wildlife Commission, Melissa, sent me this photo, showed how the antenna on this one's sticking out more, which is where it gets its name. But it's got this similar striped abdomen and these uh, furry little legs. And here's, uh, this is one in my backyard. And up close, I got a couple of shots showing that they also have these, a number of these bees are all in this group of leaf cutter bees. And they use this protraction part of their mandible to, to go around and, and chew up bits of leaf matter when they're doing their nesting. So here's one with some pretty furry legs as well. And so here is one that's got the, bared the common name of leaf cutter bee. <clears throat> and they come in a couple different flavors, which is the one on the right is all black. Uh, sometimes I see individuals where these little tufts of very pale yellow uh, looks like fur on them and there's modified hairs. And one thing I like to see on the wasps, I see this a lot. There's something about their, their diaphanous wings and the way the light hits and refracts. So this is, you know, a physical uh, thing. You can, you can read up all, all, if you like physics and refraction, and there's been a lot of math done to show how it causes the different colors of the rainbow, the visual spectrum that we see. But in wasps, what I see is it's mostly blue. It's always at the blue end of the spectrum. There's something about the, the depth of the wing and the way the scales are and the way they refract the light. So it's a really beautiful pattern. We'll see this in a few more. And so these guys also nest in cavities, <clears throat> sort of like a mason bee. And here's some up close. Again, it's a small one doing what they do. Here it's getting nectar. These, a lot of these adults go after nectar and, and then some of them consume pollen. Some of them inadvertently gather up pollen. And then one day I noticed this guy out there. I was like, well, it looks like a leaf cutter bee. It looks like one of the black <clears throat> leaf cutters, but it's got this orange abdomen. I thought, whoa, what kind of new species or something. And I couldn't quite figure out at first what it was, but then I found some photos on iNaturalist and it turns out it is the carpenter mimic leaf cutter bee. This is how they gather the pollen. So this is their method of getting pollen. They store it under their abdomen. It looks like they've got a uh, Florida navel orange here uh, taking it home to eat. But anyway, I was, it was really funny to see them flying around looking like that. Hey, John, can I ask yeah. a question? Yeah. Um, so what do you, what resource do you use to identify the bees? I like, I like to use iNaturalist, and I do it on my um, laptop. I like to use a computer uh, <laughs> software, but um, you sign up for an account, like everything, and then you can upload photos. And iNaturalist has this uh, computer vision now because they have millions of photos that people like me have uploaded, and we're able to identify them. And now... It's sort of a, you know, a self-fulfilling thing. Now other people can upload a photo that they don't know and the computer can say it looks like this one that, you know, these other people have identified as a carpenter mimic leaf cutter bee. And it's pretty close. I mean, it's not 100%, right? There's going to be something that we haven't fully identified or maybe we misidentified and the, the system hasn't corrected itself yet because it's all, it's almost all volunteers. So you've got all these other people volunteering their time to go in and make corrections and get the identifications correct, but it's all around the world. So there's millions of photos people participate. It's really, really fun to plop your images and it will suggest, it will give you like six suggestions and you can just work your way through them and see what matches. And it's always good to do a little extra research, but the other thing it does is it gives you all this information. It'll show you a map of where everybody's seeing them and it will give you uh, some biology information. It gives you links to other sites where you can go read up more about it. So it's a sort of a starting point. Uh, we have programs at Prairie Ridge, for example, where we invite people to come out and, and, and help out with uh, one of our staff, like Chris Goforth, who heads up our citizen science stuff. And she specifically does iNaturalist programs and trains people to use it. We did some summer camps this year, and we taught the kids how to use iNaturalist. The thing about iNaturalist, it's using a location, and we don't want kids, you know, we don't want them to be putting their location out, so there's a related app for your phone called Seek, S-E-E-K, and you can use it without telling 
your location. So it's good for kids to use, but it's the same thing. It draws, it was designed by the people who run iNaturalist and it uses the same photos. The thing I like about that is take my phone out and if I can get my phone close to the plant or the bee or whatever, and it, and it gets it in focus, it will also make suggestions for what it is. So those are the things that I use. And then there's bug guide and, um, um, and I even have a few books. I still read books. And so now I'll get books from the library and uh, leaf through them to look at, look at the diversity. I'll show some, yeah, some cover photos of some books at the end. So those, awesome. are, those are the well, things. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this chance to plug the moth party on Saturday night where Chris okay. go for <laughs> Is where it is an iNaturalist party, so we'll be we'll be gathering, attracting moths and posting them all on iNaturalist. So Excellent. We'll be doing that from eight thirty p.m. to ten thirty p.m. Saturday night is the final bug fest program. Oh, uh, great. And then there's also I just want to also because you mentioned the program for children. There's also Eco Explore, which yes. is which is also iNaturalist but for children. So yep. I'm, I'm plugging yep. that too. No, oh, that's great. These are all the things to to look into. <laughs> they're they're wonderful, and they're easy to use. So, all right, I'll shift to a bigger bee. Um, so we have the carpenter bee. We went from leaf cutting bees to wood cutting bees. So this is the one that will get into your porch or the side of your house and the female will dig a hole because she's looking to lay her egg and have her one larvae in a little cavity the way, uh, you know, the way I talked about the um, mason bees. These guys make a little bit bigger hole, but you can see here's the same smooth oxide a floret and she this one's about twice the size uh, but because it's a bigger bee it can go on bigger flowers like here's a passion flower and i can certainly give carrie i can give you all the passion flower you want but you might regret it these things really put the passion in passion vine they get all they grow all over my yard we have to go out there and do a little bit of management every year but it's a great flower and the carpenter bees love it uh, you can see it this guy just there i'll see two or three on one flower at one time sticking their heads in and uh, here it is picking up a little pollen from it. And you can see they have a really shiny abdomen. So that's a notable thing about a carpenter bee. And here's a really uh, good angle for seeing the, the shiny abdomen where, you know, the bumblebees have a lot of fuzz, hairy fuzz on the abdomen, but these guys, it's, it's not. And then here's the face of one. And when you see a black face on, on a carpenter bee, it's a female. And when you see one with a little yellow face, it's a male. Uh, one of the kids that I mentor, she uh, her her mom is a former junior curator, but does uh, bee work with the Wildlife Resources Commission as well as some bird work, and uh, we do a little work in the URIs together. But her daughter loves to go out and she'll pick up the male. She she knows the males and she'll pick them up and uh, because she knows she won't get stung by the males. So <laughs> every now and then she makes a mistake and grabs a female, but. She doesn't seem to mind. So the females sting, the males do not. Um, here, my colleague Melissa again sent this great shot of a carpenter bee uh, visiting this flower and had picked up a lot of pollen. Um, and here's another one of my passion flower, and it's also been picking up pollen. So <clears throat> one day I'm out there looking at the bees and taking pictures, and I turn around and I see this thing, and it's my heart stopped. It's a big, big organism. It's got these swept back wings like a fighter airplane. I thought, oh my God, what is this? And I, and I thought it was a wasp. So I'm like reaching for the EpiPen thinking this is it. But it turned out, I went online, I went on iNaturalist. It turned out it's a tiger bee fly. And what does it do? It parasitizes carpenter bees. What do you know? So uh, one of our other colleagues at NC State, Elsa Youngstead, she I think is one of our, maybe one of the speakers for Bugfest. Yep. And she has been studying. She, about two years ago, she started a study to look more into this life cycle, the double life cycle of the carpenter bee with the tiger bee fly. So the female will be going around the, the, the female fly and she's watching the carpenter bees and she'll follow them to their little nest cavities and she'll lay an egg when she can to then the, then the fly larva grows up by feeding on the larva of the carpenter bee. So that's a story that we'll hear over and over. There are some other bee flies that I've had in the yard. So they're charcoal bee flies and they parasitize the larvae of those mason bees. Um, but I think they're really cool looking. They're little swept back wings here. Again, you can see that bluish cast. This one's sort of an indigo, bluish purple. And um, 
Anyway, adorable little things. These are pretty small, these two, these charcoal bee flies. And then here's a couple that are, I think of them as a bee or wasp mimic. The ones on the right are, uh, you're probably familiar with, they, uh, people often think they, they are a hummingbird. You can see the one on the right when it's not, when it's not hovering, it's got these clear wings, but they will go to flowers and feed on these flowers, just like a hummingbird, but it's a moth. Um, and the one on the left is another moth. The one on the left is the ironweed clear wing moth, and the two on the right are called snowberry clear wing moth. Ah, the one on the left, when I saw it the first time, I thought it was another wasp. I took a photo, and and then a couple of weeks later, I got onto iNaturalist, and I was a real surprise to learn it was this ironweed moth, which made sense because here it is on an ironweed leaf, and the, I had a couple ironweeds that were dying, and no matter how much I watered them or took care of them, they kept dying, and I didn't understand. But once I read up on this, I understood that female moth lays her eggs at the base of the plant, and the larvae, after they hatch, they crawl down into the ground, and they feed on the roots of the ironweed. So it kind of kills the plant. But, you know, again, a whole circle of life. So I just plant some more ironweeds in the yard, and everybody's happy. <laughs> I couldn't figure out why the ironweeds were dying. But it's a very beautiful looking little moth. They're not very big, maybe an inch and inch and a half long. And then there are these little, so we're into the world, just a few slides to show you some mimics, what would people will think of as little bee mimics. These are little hoverflies. So you can see they have this little black and orange that remind us of a little bee. This one's a calligrapher fly. <clears throat> they're very small fly, but adorable little patterns on the back. And there are different species around. Here's another one. Um, we call it a flower fly. It's in that same hoverfly group, the Dranverse banded, just in time for Halloween. Again, you can see it pretty small. And here's a little, another little flower fly. And again, you can see this pattern. It's really, it's, it's a little bit more like a wasp to me than a, than a bee, but people will call them bee mimics. And the one that looks most like a wasp to me and always gets me to jump a little and all my colleagues, we always do a double take when this guy flies up and hovers right in front of us and it does, they, they come and get right in your face and they look for all the world like a, a yellow jacket, but then you learn the pattern. It's not quite the same and the eyes are different and you realize it's this Virginia flower fly. Really an, an attractive one. And it's a little bit bigger, so it's about the same size as, as a yellow jacket, which I'll, I'll show next. So we'll shift over to wasps. There's a few hornets around, um, I'll show, but mostly now we'll get into wasps. There's a lot of these different kinds of wasps that I've had in the yard. Most of the, many of the wasps nest above ground. You're familiar with the paper wasps like this one and the hornets. Uh, and then some are below ground, and that's why we call them digger wasps and sand wasps. The first one that I mentioned is the European hornet. And this is a photo from our colleague, Matt, over at NC State. He's usually one of our speakers, too. And um, yes, <clears throat> this one... Yes, he, he, he will be speaking, too. <laughs> All right, good. <laughs> well, um, it's a great shot. This is related to yellow jackets. It's bigger, and I say it hurts more. This is the one that stung me about... 20 years ago and sent me to the hospital. So I carry EpiPens now, thanks to this guy. So these, these hornets and wasps that are in this group, this yellow jacket group, we call them Vespid, uh, Vespidae, they have a little bit more potent venom. Their toxin is, is different from other bees and wasps. And this is why they are uh, give bring a little more fear into those of us that spend a lot of time in the field. And so I carry multiple EpiPens around just, just because of something like this. Um, so you just have to, you know, you watch out for this and we watch out for yellow jackets. Uh, the, so here's the Eastern yellow jacket. There are a couple of species in our area. Most, most of us are familiar with the Eastern yellow jacket. And the other problem with yellow jackets and, and or wasps in general, but yellow jacket in particular is when they sting, they can sting multiple times. They also leave a little pheromone, a little chemical marker and all her sisters, she's, you know, she'll sting you and all her sisters come out and they're like red alert and they can sense exactly where that chemical is. So they come flying over to your arm or your back and start trying to sting you as well. So if you get stung once, you gotta get, you gotta get out of the way. You gotta go in the house or jump in the lake or something uh, so that they can't uh, see that chemical and keep stinging you. I've been stung by small bees and wasps since and they don't cause much of a reaction in me. I get a little swelling. Uh, so there's a, a different, at least for now, there's been a real difference in the kinds of reaction I have because the venom is different. 
Here's one that is called a velvet ant, but it's not an ant, it's a wasp. It's, this is a wingless female wasp and they parasitize bumblebees. And when you find one, like this one on the left and same photo on the upper right, she will spend all her time walking around and it's hard to get a photograph with my point and shoot camera because it's a slower shutter speed. And so I finally had to catch one and just wedge her into this fold of my jacket because she wouldn't sit still. And the only way I could get her in focus was to do this because she is on the prowl. She's looking for one of the bumblebees nesting either in that rodent furrow in the grass or in the ground. And she will lay her eggs and, and then it will be, she will parasitize the, uh, the bumblebees. Uh, there are several species. Most of us are going to see the Eastern velvet ant and you'll hear people talk about it as being a really nasty sting. And online, there's a lot of folklore and they call it the cow killer. But in fact, that has been studied. People go out and let themselves be stung by different bees and wasps. And what they have found is that actually the honeybee hurts more than the uh, velvet ant. So I'm not sure where it all started, but you know how folklore can be. <laughs> Still, I don't like the way a honeybee feels either. So I'm not gonna get stung. I'm not gonna let myself get stung. <clears throat> Um, at the other end are these little tiny aphid wasps, dainty little thing. You can see it on the side of one of our drinking glasses here. It doesn't have a, this one doesn't have a full common name. I found the species name here, the scientific name. It's just in the group of aphid wasps. It's another one where people will sometimes use them for biological control because they, they will feed on aphids. So you can, uh, you can get a group of them and say, put them in, a, in an orchard or garden. If you have an aphid problem, to try to control, but it's a small one. And, uh, so here's another photo of it on the side of the glass. So you can see it's pretty tiny. These, um, they started showing up in my kitchen one day, a couple of years ago. I, I like to work in the kitchen and uh, by the back window and they just started popping up and, and flying to the window to get out. So I would catch them and let them out. And finally I took a photo and then I did some reading and realized that they, uh, they will overwinter, some will overwinter in the ground and they had probably some had probably burrowed into one of my potted plants that was on the porch in the summer that I had brought in for the winter. And because I put those in by the kitchen window and they were now hatching out. Um, but after about a dozen of them and catching and releasing them all, I finally, I finally let them out. Hey John, did... we have a question in the chat going back to the velvet ants. Um, so a friend wants to know had to, had a velvet ant in their yard and they want to know if they have to worry. Well, I'm not, I don't, I don't really worry about them because I'm not, you know, I'm not handling them per se, other than this one, which I corralled. I didn't really handle it. Um, <clears throat> so I, like I say, it is not, um, it's not any, it doesn't sting as much as like a honeybee does. And our, you know, our yards are full of honeybees. I would be far more concerned about a honeybee because like when I was a kid, I stepped on every other honeybee in my yard and, um, <laughs> Just why I probably became so allergic. I finally just finally something just triggered in my body. Enough's enough. But you know, honeybees. I think as kids we were always catching honeybees and getting stung by the honeybee. It's it's you're not gonna you're not gonna get stung by May. It's hard to catch them. She's always running. Uh, and then again, she's doing her part. She's you know looking for a bumblebee nest somewhere. It's all part of that cycle. And everybody's got to be food for somebody else. So um, no, I would just enjoy it. Uh, and you probably won't see it very often. They're not common. It, it, I, I've never, I never see more than one in a, in a fairly large area. They don't seem to be very high density. So that's my take on it. And then, you know, just don't pick it up. But anytime you see black and red or black and orange, that's usually a good sign not to handle it. <laughs> that's what we call an aposomatic coloration. It's a warning sign. Um, and it, it generally works. There are some mimics, of course, but that's okay. We, you can just leave everything alone. So, so Mar Marcel wants to confirm. So, this is not a colony, right? This is just one individual right, male, right? right? They're it solitary is, right. wasps. They're solitary, right? It's a solitary. So, she's out looking for one group of colony, uh, colony of bumblebees, but she's by herself. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. So, yeah, we'll move on. And I did call the dentist, by the way. So, we're on. <laughs> and then. Another one that people, people do get a little worried about it, but you don't, you don't have to be. That's cicada wasp. Um, <clears throat> you don't have to worry unless you're a cicada. They, this, the female does the stinging. She's only looking for a cicada. 
because she's going to take that cicada, she stings it and paralyzes it, takes it back to her little cavity in the ground, stuffs it in, lays an egg, seals it up, and her little child will grow up by feeding on this cicada. Um, and they come out in July and August. They're, they're not seeing so many now. They're pretty much done, but they do. They are big. They're big as you know, big as what you think of as a hornet. And they net. They often nest in a small colony where you might see five, six, or seven. It depends. If you've got a big patch of loose dirt, you've maybe you've just used your tiller and you've plowed up some dirt, but you've decided to let it sit for a few months, and it's nice and loose, and she can dig a hole. And lo and behold. Here come her friends and they got five or six or seven of them around it can be pretty intimidating it's a beautiful beautiful walk but you don't have to worry about it she's not gonna sting. you'd have to squeeze her to get her to sting you she's just not she's not interested and the males are smaller and they're not interested at all they can't sting anyway so john marcel wants to know um how long is the cicada paralyzed well i don't remember long enough for the bait the egg to hatch and the larva to grow up and then pupate um my guess is it all takes place in a couple of weeks it would be my guess the eggs hatch must hatch out within like three days most of these insects at small eggs they seem to hatch out in three or four days <clears throat> and then the cycle i'm thinking about monarchs you know the little the larvae grow up in about 12 14 days so i'm guessing these these large Wasps like this are doing the same thing in a couple of weeks. They're they're probably good to go. So, yeah, it's an interesting you know way to make a living. But a lot of them are doing it. That's you know you'll hear me say this over and over for the rest of the talk. All these all these wasps are feeding on something else like this. There is a lot of information about some of them. They have been cicada wasps been studied. So I would definitely encourage you to to go online and and do some read reading up on that because there have been studies on this one because they're so frequent in urban areas. So here's one in my yard. So she got this cicada one day. I happened to be out there and spotted her fly. She flew in, grabbed, stung the cicada, and she's dragging it across the yard. She drug it up into one of my potted plants. I guess she was thinking the soil might work, but it didn't. She kept going. And then what was neat was she went up this oak tree. We had a big white oak tree in the yard. She went up, up, up. I'm standing there. She's above me now. I'm six feet tall. She's seven, eight. She got up to about nine feet. At that point, you know, she has figured out how they do this. You know, it's just great. She's figured out that she's got enough altitude. She's high enough that she can launch. And she's she didn't launch horizontal. I mean, she lost a little bit of altitude, but then she got enough speed to form enough lift because that's how you get lift under the the wing is you need some speed to airflow. She got enough lift to then get back up before she hit the ground and then took off down the street. I couldn't follow her to wherever her nest was. So she knew how to get up high enough to be able to fly off with this giant thing in her in her grip and, and fly back to her nest. This is amazing to watch. Um, <clears throat> So another group of wasps in the area are potter wasps. They're um, adults are feeding on nectar. And again, they're going to have larvae that go after some other critter. So they build a little mud nest. Now they call them potter wasps because they have a, they make a, they make a pot, a pot shape or a vase shape. They're kind of cute to see. And so they're related to somewhat related to mud daubers that of course make the little mud columns and they behave similarly where they go after a caterpillar, they sting it, they paralyze it. They, they put it, they shove it into the pot, or if it's a mud dauber, up that little column, and then they lay their egg, and the larvae, the wasp larvae, will feed on the caterpillar and mature that way. So I've had a few species of potter wasp in my yard. I haven't had this one yet. Missy sent me a, a photo <clears throat> from somebody else's yard. This is a neat one with the little orangey-brown coloration. Um, so they're in this group called also called thread-waisted wasps, and... Uh, the one that I get is this black one with the little white spots. And you can see it's on mountain mint again. Uh, once again, they are adults are feeding on nectar and then the larvae are feeding on, in this case, butterfly and moth caterpillars. So here's the black and white one, different angles that I see in the yard. Here's you can see where they call them thread waisted wasp. Very dainty little things, about an inch and a half <clears throat> long. And then here's a, a different potter wasp that 
showed up in the yard this summer. Really pretty one. It's this soft yellow banding on, on a black body. Going after nectar. Back on some mountain mint, some smooth oxide. Smooth oxide is another good one. And then here's yet a third species of potter wasps. This one is black and white, but the white is much bolder. The bands are much bolder. So yeah, it's been fun to see these different ones again showing up. Now, here's a here's an interesting little story, a little creepy story. So I haven't found any cuckoo bees or cuckoo wasps in my yard. They should be around. I just haven't noticed. But here's a couple. Um, somebody took this in the Piedmont of North Carolina. That's all it said on on Wikimedia. And then Melissa, Missy got one here uh, on a mint. These are cuckoo, two species of cuckoo wasps. And what they are, it's and they're essentially a parasite of a parasite. So they they lay their eggs on the larvae of the thread wasted wasp, which I just got through showing you some thread wasted wasps. So remember, the thread wasted wasp is going to paralyze some caterpillars of a moth or butterfly. Now the cuckoo wasp comes along, and <clears throat> and it lays the um, egg inside of the thread wasted wasp. And in that in this case, the cuckoo wasp larvae can feed on both the caterpillar of the butterfly or moth and the wasp larvae. And some studies have shown that what the uh, a given species of cuckoo wasp will wait uh, for the lepidoptera larvae to, uh, or for the wasp of the thread wasted wasp to finish eating the lep. And then the wasp, this wasp is big. And then the cuckoo wasp comes and eats the, <laughs> the, the big thread wasted wasp. So it's like, well, you know, kind of like, pre-digested or what have you. So anyway, it's, a, it's quite a world out there. So uh, bald face hornets, I'm just shifting gears here. That's it. Uh, I think most of us have seen these big uh, papery nests around. Here's what they look like up close. Uh, the blackish hornet with a lot of white in the head and thorax region. And here's the face of one. So that's where it gets its name of bald face or white face hornet. I see them around in my neighborhood now and then. They usually build these nests pretty high up. So it's usually not anything I'm concerned about because they're pretty high up. So I'm going to shift over to this group of finish up on these different wasps. There's sand wasps and paper wasps and digger wasps in, in a group called this, in the family Scoliidae, and they just call them Scoliid wasps. So a lot of, a lot of variation. Again, they're feeding on nectar, laying eggs on some larval host. The wasp egg hatches eats the larvae of the host, and sometimes the wasps lay on other wasps. Same thing. It's just a real mess out there. So let's look at a, a variety of species here. This is a katydid wasp. <clears throat> so a pretty obvious <clears throat> why. It's a lay its eggs on a paralyzed katydid. So it's a black one with orange legs. And here it is on mountain mint again. I do not have a big patch of mountain mint but it is what I would call a quality patch of mountain mint. <laughs> so many things have come through in the last just a couple months. And then here's a great black digger wasp. They will feed on Katie did as well as a cricket or grasshopper, enjoying some mountain mint. Most of these have finished coming. They come in June and July and August. Uh, by September, things really are fading. This one is probably the rarest one in my yard. It's the golden rain at digger wasp. It's very shy. I had a very hard time getting photos. I've only seen it three times. Uh, it doesn't sit still. The minute I try to zoom in a little or get a picture, it just takes off. It'll just take off and not come back. Uh, this is the other species of mint you can see. I, I can't remember the name, but it's um, a pycnanthemum, as I recall. And this is the mountain mint. But um, you can see it's got these little, uh, like a bit of golden color on the collar and a little bit on the back, and then sometimes the legs can be this gold color, um, but it's, uh, yeah, so anyway, it's it's the least common one. Um, one of the prettiest ones is the great golden digger wasp. Uh, with this, uh, it's really, it's not so much gold as it is uh, more of an orangey brown. And when the sunlight hits it, it's really dramatic. The legs and the lower, the upper half of the abdomen is really something to see in the sunlight. <laughs> So paper wasps, <clears throat> um, which I snuck in here, um, we're all familiar with the ones that uh, build the nests under our soft beds, our front porch. They're in the genus Polistes. And there are several species around. They, uh, they are efficient predators. 
very efficient. And so they're, they're still, uh, they're a carnivorous one. And I mention them because they are so efficient that if you're, if you're, what I do is I call it farming for uh, butterflies, especially monarch butterflies. You really have to keep an eye on the paper that's around your house because um, this is a recent pe publication that just came out looking at what happens when you plant all these milkweeds in your yard and attract all these monarchs, but you don't pay attention to what's going on with the paper wasp. And it just becomes this trap. And I have seen this in my yard. I have to monitor the, the milkweed and the monarchs constantly. And I, I actually, uh, right now I have a mosquito tent over six giant milkweed plants because I have five monarchs that have pupated, but I was, I tented them <laughs> in order to keep the wasps from eating them, the larvae, the caterpillar. And there's two little larvae still, and they, they need a week to grow up. So I finally just put a big mosquito tent over them in order to uh, give them a chance. And then if I find the paper wasp nest around my house, I just knock the nest down. I don't mind the wasps if they nest way down my yard by the street, for example, or out in the, uh, in the shrubbery, but when they're by my house, which is where a lot of my milkweed are, then I manage, I knock them down. It's just something you have to think about. Here's probably the most common one in my yard, which is called a metric paper wasp. It is a black abdomen and then this rusty colored head and thorax with these uh, cute little golden slippers, I call them. And one in the group of sand wasps, so they, they, they will, the adults will dig in the sand to do their nesting. And this one has got the longest name of any of them, the four banded stink bug hunter. And so what it's going so what that's telling you is that the adults, uh, as I said, they're feeding on here on nectar and palm, but it's going to go after a stink bug to lay the egg to feed its um, young. So it will lay an egg on the young. So even though it says four banded, if you're paying attention, you might notice this one has a fifth band. Sometimes they do. That's the variation in nature. And some have this yellowish wash to them and others are black and white. It's a dramatic looking one out there. There are some stink bugs around. There's this Mediterranean one. It's not native, so it's nice to sometimes when these guys show up, they will help control the, the non-native stink bug. I also have one that's from uh, a non-native one. I think it's from New Zealand that showed up in my yard. And then there's a native one, stink bug. So these guys help with natural control. There's a, a group of wasps in this group called spider wasps. They also nest in the ground. And uh, <clears throat> this one is the elegant tarantula hawk wasp. I, I found a 2005 publication that stated that we don't really know what this thing feeds on, uh, but somebody conjectured it might be the trapdoor spider because this wasp is related to other wasps that feed on tarantulas. So out west, for example, or in the tropics, there are other tarantula hawk wasp species and they do paralyze a tarantula, shove it in the ground in a hole, lay an egg, same thing, same story. But this one, I was sort of surprised. This one's not uncommon. And yet they were saying that they still, nobody had really documented what they feed on. But they were thinking that maybe it feeds on um, a trapdoor spider. So here's a trapdoor spider. It was a couple blocks away in my neighborhood. And uh, you can see it's, uh, it kind of looks like a tarantula. And in a way they're related to tarantula. So maybe that's what they feed on. And maybe since then, I, I didn't take a, a, a deep look to see if in the last 15 years, somebody has figured out what they're feeding on, but um, maybe they have. You can see again, the bluish cast on the, on the wings of this, this one. It's all black with these golden antennas. And then I, I just found this one this, this two weeks ago. I wouldn't say it's rare. I just haven't been able to find one in, in our neighborhood or in my yard, but this one showed up. And kind of like the, um, kind of like that velvet ant. So she, this is a female and she is looking for a spider. It's, an, it's another spider wasp and she's looking for a spider and she's got things to do. She's busy. That means she's not going to sit around and let me focus and get a good photograph of her and she did not would not sit still i managed to get her by the curb in the street but she went right back into the leaf straw the pine the pine straw and she she is looking for a um a wolf spider and this is what a rabid wolf spider looks like so most of you are familiar with uh wolf spiders i think um they are not rabid but that's the name um this is one with all her babies on her back but uh that's what that this one specializes on just 
this species of wolf spider. So she was out doing her thing. And you can see it's like the other tarantula uh, wasp I just showed you with the yellow and black, but she's got this rufous patch on her uh, on the back side, tips of her wings. So that was my first time just a couple of weeks ago. So I'll shift over to these scolded wasps. Um, they are, there's a variety of spe many species. I've had a uh, half a dozen in the neighborhood. This showed up on those Cosmos plants up at my, my neighbor's patch. It's a really cute one. It's called the feather legged scolded wasp. You can see it's got a lot of little hairs and spurs coming off the, the legs here. So that's a good name for it. This is the first time I'd seen one of these in the neighborhood. Uh, this one, I don't know why it's noble, but it's called the Noble Scolied Wasp. I've only seen it uh, once in my yard this summer. Uh, this one was downtown at the museums. Uh, we have some native plants outside the the front door on the pedestrian mall, and I had to I had to catch it and put it in a little clear box just to get a photograph, and then I let it go. But uh, they uh, they're when they're busy, they're busy as a bee. Only that's a wasp, but it's sometimes hard to get them in focus. This guy just wouldn't stop moving either. But it's a nice little black and orange one. Another one on the same pattern where it's got some black and, and sort of orange, but little yellow spots is this blue-winged scoliad. <clears throat> and again, got that same strong bluish cast from the refraction of the light. It looks black in some angles, and then it's beautiful indigo in others. Really like seeing them around. <clears throat> and finally, there's this uh, double-banded one that's shown up a few times. Black with these two white bands on it. And here's one that was out in the front yard. And here she is. She's looking for a beetle larva. So this is one that feeds on beetles, including Japanese beetle and June bug, June beetle. So people like it that they're around to feed on, say, the Japanese beetle. It's not native. But here she is. And again, it was hard to get her in focus because she's got she's got work to do. She's looking for a beetle to lay her to paralyze and bring back to her nest. Um, I'll leave you with this one. This is the Sculptured Resin Bee. It's a great name. And when I first saw it, I was so excited. It was actually west of here. It was a couple hours west. It's here it is on common milkweed. It could show up anywhere. Beautiful, big body. This thing is like an inch and a half or, or longer. I'd never seen anything like it. This beautiful gold colored black body with looked like tire treads on it. It was really something. And I was so happy to get a, a photograph because my hands were shaking. I thought, this is so cool. But anyway, when I, when I went online to read about it, it's not native. So it was one of these is accidentally introduced fairly recently. And we never know what the impact of these things are going to be. Sometimes it can be pretty devastating to the natural ecosystem, <clears throat> but nobody knows. This is fair, just in the last few years that this showed up. And uh, so people are just keeping an eye on it and documenting when and where. And then, you know, we'll see, we'll see what happens. It, it may integrate just fine. It may not harm native, other native bee and wasp populations, but but it might, We're, it, it, we don't know. So that's that. Um, these are some resources and we can also send those out or you can take a photograph with your phone or do a screen capture. Um, give it just a second. And then- Yeah, and Nancy these, dropped a bunch of those um, in the chat too. Okay, great. So. These are some of the books I've enjoyed looking at. Um, uh, and I'm going to do one plug because in one minute, um, Dr. Joe Wilson, <laughs> who wrote oh, great. Bees in Your Backyard, is going to do a talk. <laughs> Excellent. There it is. So, you know, these are some more books out. Um, Bumblebee Economics was a great book that Bern Heinrich wrote about 40 years ago. It still applies. Um, these are plants that I like. I sent this in. So... If people are interested, we can email that. Yeah, out. what? Yeah, what? Yeah, I'll do that, John. If you send that list to me, I will um, email that that out to everybody who registered today, okay. and we'll get right. this list because I need it too, and I need All some right. of your passion flower and uh, mountain mint. All right. Uh, <laughs> so. <laughs> been, a rough, been a rough year. Last couple of years have been a rough year, but I hope you're able to get out, get out into some places, and enjoy some open space. Enjoy the pollinators out there. Um, and yeah, I'll leave you with one more little, little poem. And I know we were, we've already answered some questions. Uh, normally I say I would answer questions, but if we only got a minute to go, we better, we better move on to the next one. If, 
If there are yes. other questions, though, we can, you know, you can send them to me and I can always answer them and send them. Absolutely. Out. And everybody got an email from me. So if you don't have John's email, send them to me and I will make sure I connect right. you with John. Right. All right. Well, John, what I'm going to stop your sharing and I'm going to do my own sharing really quickly just to let everybody know that of course it's not bug fest without a bug fest t-shirt so if you want your shirt just head on over to um you can go to bugfest.org and we have a t-shirt uh link right there that you can order them from the store or we will be um on site with a mini a little tiny mini bug fest a pollination celebration from 9 to 12 out at our prairie ridge eco station and we'll have t-shirts there with that, thank you, John, so much. This has been such a wonderful program. You make me, you inspire me to plant more native plants and to document my species that visit them. And I really want to learn my bees now. So thank you, John. Thank you, everyone who joined us today. Thank you to BASF, our sponsor of Bug Fest this year. And also, if you are not already a member of the museum, please consider joining because membership funds help us do programs like this and many others throughout the year. With that, have a wonderful afternoon and we'll see you at another Bug Fest program, hopefully. Thank you.